Good morning. Welcome to the second Sunday morning worship service at Emmanuel, being brought to you through our website, EmmanuelJoplin.com. I spent a good deal of time this past Friday talking with health care professionals, Pastor Meck, our chief elder, Jeff Schilling, and other church leadership here at Emmanuel about the impact the coronavirus pandemic is having or will have on our community. It is with a sad heart that I'm here to inform the congregation that we will continue our suspension of public worship services through the month of April as our community continues to fight the coronavirus battle. Although our state and local leaders have not yet forced a shelter at home policy, it is likely soon to happen. Even so, the social distan distancing and no more than 10 people in a group gathering guidelines that remain in effect preclude our worshiping together at this time. Our Martin Luther School will also be closed through April 24th, as are all area schools. As unpleasant as the decision to suspend our worshiping together is, especially as we approach Easter, the highest festival season of the year, please know that it is made in the best interest of our membership and our church staff. We want to keep everyone as safe and healthy as possible. In the meantime, please make sure to log on at EmmanuelJoplin.com or on Facebook Live at Facebook.com slash Emmanuel Joplin to worship with us remotely on Sundays and for Lenten services. And please continue to mail in your weekly offerings. It is critical at this time that we are not, when we are not able to meet together, that we keep financially sound. And now let us worship together. Psalm 46, verse 10, is a favorite for many of us. The Lord says, be still and know that I am God. The very first verse of Psalm 46 was a favorite of Martin Luther's. And he built an entire hymn around God's presence and its certainty, even when the whole world is in upheaval. He called it a mighty fortress, and we are pleased to sing it today.
This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your ways. Sanctify us with your truth. Your word is truth. From the rising of the sun to its setting. The name of the Lord is to be praised. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls, and a good morning, church family. I was looking at my Bible this week and I saw in the book of Psalms that uh, David writes that God collects our tears and saves our tears in a bottle. And uh, I don't know if God really collects them in an actual bottle, but I do know that our God listens to us uh, when we're sad and he cares about us when we cry. In today's Bible reading, we're going to hear of a time when Jesus cried. In fact, Jesus wept. He really cares for his people. You see, his friends, Mary and Martha, their brother Lazarus had died. And when Jesus came to be with them, he saw their sadness and he was sad too. Because death is something that makes people sad. It makes God sad too. It's not God's plan that anyone should die. So Jesus wept that day. And then he went and he raised his friend Lazarus from the dead and changed all of that sadness and all of that weeping and all of that crying and those tears into joy, into hope, into life. You know, I've cried my tears lately. Somebody very close to me in my family died a few weeks ago. And uh, I did a lot of crying. I did a lot of shedding of tears. But God has told me in his word that he's with me, that he cares about me, and he cares about my family, and he has given me a reason to wipe away my tears. Because those of us who die in faith, those of us who pass away, will live again, are living now, because of what Jesus has done at his cross. So I invite you to listen carefully to the scripture reading today. Because pastor's going to talk about this story of Lazarus and Mary and Martha and what God has done to make sure that there are no more tears in our eyes when we're sad. Because in heaven someday, he will wipe every one of them away. Let's have a quick prayer together. Dear Jesus, it is comforting to know that when we cry, you cry with us. But it is even more comforting to know that you have power over death in the grave and that one day, we will be in heaven with you, 
and then there will be no more tears. Amen. Thank you. Our first reading for today is from Ezekiel chapter 37. And the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out of the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. And he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost, and we are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves. O my people, and I will bring my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken. And I will do it, declares the Lord. This is the word of the, God, of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Our epistle reading today comes from Romans chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set your mind on the flesh is death, but to set your mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead, because of sin, the spirit is life of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks.
The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 11th chapter. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Mary and Martha to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an order, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around so that they may believe that you have sent me. When he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. Nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God, who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. This is the word of the Lord. For our response read today, we use the, the psalm which is appointed for this Sunday, Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquity, O Lord, who could stand? My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. 
For with the Lord there is steadfast love. And with him is plentiful redemption. Since the focus today is on the resurrection, both in Ezekiel and in John, I chose as our catechism, catechism section the third article of the Apostles' Creed. What is the third article? In so saying, what do you confess? What does this mean? I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, work unto him, for the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way, he calls and gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth, and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, he daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead, and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. Grace is yours, and mercy and peace from God our Father, and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I guess this is installment number three in what I'm calling in my back in my study, the Plague Series. The title for today's sermon is, Wanting to Be Any Place But Here. And I'll have to admit that much of what I'm going to say today, maybe all of it, is not original. 
It's based primarily on the, the writings of, of Dr. David Schmidt of Concordia Seminary in St. Louis and our good friend Chad Bird, uh, our favorite Texas truck driver. When Lazarus became ill, Martha sent word to Jesus. She asked Jesus to come, but he delayed. When he finally did arrive, her brother was days dead. Her life was filled with sorrow. She was standing there in the road with Jesus, looking to the past and looking to the future, wanting to be anywhere but here. Martha knew what could have been. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Martha knew what would be. I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. But what could have been and what will be do not change what is right now. Her brother is dead. Her Lord is late. And her life is filled with sorrow. And this moment for Martha is familiar to most of us. It's where we spend much of our time, on the road to resurrection. When we look to the past, we know what was and what could have been. And when we look to the future, we know what will be for us in Jesus. But right now, we're in the middle of suffering. What could have been and what will be do not change the present moment of our lives. We, when Jesus spoke to Martha, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. And I want you to notice, he doesn't say, I will be Lazarus's resurrection. He doesn't make a reference to Ezekiel and the, the valley of dry bones. He doesn't say, I was the hope of Israel. He doesn't say, I will be the one who comes again. In order to confront Martha with the enormity of the resurrection, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, standing right here in the road with you. Jesus takes the power of the resurrection and the promise of life and says that we can find it in his own flesh. This Jesus, Martha, the one who is speaking to you right now, is the resurrection and the life for you. This Jesus who is speaking to you right now, though in this place only two or three are gathered, well, actually five, but this Jesus who is speaking to you right now is the resurrection and your life. And what this means is that before Lazarus walked out of that tomb, before Jesus was raised from the dead, right now, as Martha stood in the middle of that long road to resurrection, Jesus is the resurrection and the life for her. He has come to be the resurrection and the life for her, even in sorrow. In this moment, before Lazarus is raised from the dead. What does it mean that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? It means that the resurrection is a hand that can be touched, a voice that can be heard, an arm that can embrace, a tear that can be traced a holy conversation 
that happens with Jesus in the midst of sorrow. What Jesus teaches us here is that we don't have to wait until the body comes out of the tomb to participate in the resurrection. Jesus is the resurrected life right now. We don't need to silence the suffering, to mask the mourning, to placate the pain. Instead, we can receive them as holy. Jesus is the resurrection and the life in the midst of this sorrow. What he gives us is this, moments of holy conversation on our lifelong road that leads to our resurrection. He chooses to bring the wonder of his life to us now even in these most unusual circumstances. The internet has been known for about 20 years now as a place where you could find dangerous distractions, hackers, a place that was filled with pornography, and with endless, endless ads and games, with people's bragging about what they bought for lunch at a restaurant you never went to. Isn't it amazing? I don't know what the devil intended by this disease, but what I see now when I go to the internet, I see children learning in ways that they've never explored as teachers expand their capabilities, face their limitations, and find new ways. I see one pastor after another, as uncomfortable as I obviously am, in front of this camera, still standing here, and filling the entire internet. with the hope of Christ. Jesus is our resurrection, our life. He brings the wonder of his life to us now. I mentioned before that it's going to bring a little bit from Chad Bird. Chad Bird talks about three words in Hebrew, especially in the Psalms, that are like handholds. In fact, if you want to look this up yourself, you could do an internet search for three Hebrew handholds in a spinning crisis by Chad Bird. He talks about three different words that are very small words, words that you could go right on past, but words that have been featured in our psalm so far today. The first of them is a word that can be translated as relax. It's a word that means let your hands, your arms droop. It's translated in the NIV and in the ESV as be still. Be still and know that I am God, Psalm 46 says. In Psalm 46, the whole world was in turmoil. Everything was turned upside down. Mountains falling into the sea, the earth giving way underneath people's feet. No place to stand. But the Lord is with us. He causes wars to cease. He conquers the pestilence. He moves amongst his people. And he tells them, be still. And know that I am God. I accomplish this. Oh, it shows up a lot of other places as well, but it's especially in Psalm 46. God is saying, and I'm quoting here from Chaz Bird, Chad Bird, 
I know that your life is a tailspin. All around you, turmoil threatens. I am your refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. I am with you. I am your fortress. This current crisis is not my first rodeo. I've been handling these things for my people from the beginning of time. I've got this. Relax. And know this. I am God. Not just God. Your God. The life of the resurrection. The second word is wait. It showed up in our psalm, Psalm 130 today. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. O Lord, O Israel, hope in the Lord. Did you notice how the waiting and the hoping go together? There are two different kinds of of waiting that, that Chad Bird talks about. He says, imagine a couple that is waiting to conceive and it simply isn't happening. They're going through all necessary, following all necessary advice, But still, there is no child conceived. It's an interminable waiting. Maybe one day they will conceive a child. Maybe they will not. But then there's the kind of waiting where you know what is likely to happen. Where that waiting is coupled with hope. As in Psalm 130, it starts out, Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord, but we cry out in patient waiting and in hope of the Lord. That word wait is also featured pretty prominently in Psalm 27. Wait for the Lord, be strong. Let your heart take courage and wait for the Lord. Now, this isn't an easy thing for David in Psalm 27. He says, I'm surrounded by cannibals. Well, okay, he doesn't say cannibals. But what he says is, I'm surrounded by people who want to eat up my flesh. Cannibals. Armies are encamped against Israel. False witnesses are surrounding him. Even his parents have forsaken him. But David says, I believe that I shall look in goodness on the Lord. In the land of the living. And therefore I wait. And so do we. Announcements that were made just prior to this service let you know we're going to be waiting a while. We can't pinpoint a date when finally we're going to be able to resume lives of normality. In fact, we suspect that our future life might never be like what we have had before this. But we don't wait on normality. We don't wait on our expectations. We wait on the Lord. For our Lord, the Messiah, is the stronghold of our life. Life might be changing rapidly around us, but God remains the same Lord in mercy, yesterday, today, and forever. And while we wait for the Lord, we watch. God himself is watching. He presents himself as being the watchman. We heard about it already in Psalm 130, quoted earlier. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchman for the morning. More than watchman for the morning. 
Why? Because with the Lord there is steadfast love. With him is plentiful redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all their iniquities. In the ancient world, the watchman was the guardian of the city, stationed on its walls or at its gates to ensure that if the enemy did come near, that everyone would be alerted. While others slept, he was awake. Another of our favorite psalms is Psalm 121 where the word for being a watchman or a guardian shows up six times in just those eight short verses. I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not, be, he will not let your foot be moved. He who watches you will not slumber. Behold, he who guards Israel, same word in the Hebrew, he who guards Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your watchman, your guardian. The Lord is the shade on your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day nor the moon by night. For the Lord will guard you from all evil. He will watch over your life. The Lord will guard, watch over, defend. You're going out and you're coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Our good and gracious God is no heavy-eyed, yawning novice of a watchman. He who made heaven and earth has been doing this since creation's dawn. He neither slumbers nor sleeps, but constantly watches over his beloved people. When we pray, deliver us from evil, our watchman, our guardian says, I will defend you, watch over and guard you against all evil. The Lord who has given his very life for ours will keep our lives in safety. And so these three words, relax, wait, and watch, summarize our lives right now and into the foreseeable future. Let our world spin as wildly as it might. These handholds will not be shaken or removed. For now, we relax, we wait, and we trust in Jesus, our guardian, friend, our king, the resurrection and the life. Let us enter more deeply into what is happening. Wherever you are on that long journey to resurrection, Jesus has come to be with you. He is the resurrection and the life, even in the midst of sorrow, filling our present days with love, life, and hope. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, by your great goodness, mercifully look upon your people, that we may be governed and preserved evermore in body and soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O God of power and might, you hold in your hand all the might of man. Give to us good government and faithful leaders who will heed your word and pursue righteousness and justice. 
Bless and defend us against all destruction, especially from this deadly pandemic. And teach us to be patient and faithful citizens of this land, using ourselves and our resources wisely for the good of all. O merciful Lord, your Son shed tears for Lazarus, whom he loved. Grant your compassion, patience, and endurance to all who suffer illness, who are touched in mind or whose time troubled in mind, or whose time on earth is short. Spare us from death now, but give us courage and comfort far stronger by your power over death. Eternal God, you carry the grief of all who mourn, and remember all who die in Christ. So give comfort to the grieving and patience to the dying. And give that same comfort and peace to us who live in the shadow and the fear of death, that we would neither live nor grieve as people who have no hope, but wait and trust in you in every hour. Hear our prayers, especially on behalf of those who have requested them. We thank you, Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you've kept us this night from all harm and danger, We pray that you would keep us this day also from sin and every evil that all our doings and life may please you. Into your hands we commit ourselves, our bodies and souls and all things. Let your holy angel be with us, that the evil foe may have no power over us. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. Thank you.